Hello and good evening um, again here in the R3S stage. Um, the next talk is again referring to the nightmares of an InfoSec professional who got imprisoned because, well, because he simply did his job. He's a cybersecurity expert and he didn't commit a crime at all. Yet he got arrested in 2017 and only received a copy of his thousand pages file of his case last year in 2019. And here he is tonight to tell us his story. And he does not only want to hear your questions, but also your feedback. So please get interactive and let him know what you think about his case and his story. Please use our channels to get in touch and join in and welcome Alberto Daniel Hill, who talks about his login to hell. Welcome, Alberto. The stage is yours. Hello, Germany. This is Alberto Hill. I'm from Uruguay, and I am the first information security professional that was sent to prison in my country. Uh, well, since then, they call me the hacker, not the infosec professional. And I am here to share my story with you. Uh, forget about being guilty or not guilty, but focus on the process. And I want you to to visualize all the problems that are obviously uh, in the system that must be changed immediately because it's full of flaws and lacks of any warranty of having a fair process. And what happened to me can happen to anyone. And things must change. And when you see that something is wrong and you want to change it to, to improve it, what do you do? You talk about it. And that's what I'm doing here right now and uh, sharing my story with you. Well, I am an information security professional that uh, has worked in security for 20 years uh, in computer forensics, consulting, managing projects, uh, implementing ISO EEC 27,000 uh, systems. Uh, I work almost in every field of information security. I'm also an ethical hacker. In 2016, I detected a problem in the stock exchange of Asunción Paraguay. Uh, the system had an important problem. I couldn't contact them, so I contact the third of my country so they could be a link uh, with them to, to report the problem. Uh, December of 2016, I found a very important problem in the most important insurance company of Uruguay, the largest one, where, well, I had a car accident, and when I got home, I got an SMS with a code where I could enter the web and track the status of my insurance. Well, after entering, I realized that I could access to all the records of all the accidents, all the people involved, the personal information of the people, police reports, uh, the reports of the doctors, everything, the pictures of the accidents, everything. I report that to the CERT immediately. And in 2017, I basically hacked one of the largest uh, information security organizations in the world, I reported that to them. As I always do, as I always did. And also, by the way, in 2016, I reported a debility in the 
TV, uh, YouTube TV service, just uh, a little debility that they had. So uh, before that, I have always reported every problem that I found because uh, that's the way I am. I didn't, I, I never ever got anything in return. Here we don't have bug bounty um, established, so you don't get money for reported for reporting those those problems. Uh, well, and in 2014, I report a problem in a medical provider of Uruguay where you could access to all the rec to all the system using the password admin and the username admin uh, in the, via web you could access to all the systems with privileges of administrator uh, a year after that in the same medical provider that was the medical provider of my ex-girlfriend that's why I was accessing to, to that site I found another big problem where I could access to all the information, just modifying the parameters of the URL. You don't have to be uh, logged in. You don't have to uh, authenticate you. You just have to alter just a number in the URL and you could browse all the patient's data, all the financial records of the medical provider. It was serious. I report that. In 2017, September, uh, Interpol arrested me. They told me it was because of the medical provider. Uh, apparently, they received, uh, they were attacked in February of that year, and they received an extorsive email asking for a certain amount of bitcoins in order not to release the information that they had. And, well, in my first uh, interrogation with the people of the Interpol, they asked me, did, I send, did you send this email? They told me, we have this paper where your IP address is linked to the email. I knew that they were bluffing that that was a lie, that was not possible. So I, I smiled and said, okay, if you have that, then the mail was sent from my house, but I knew that it was not possible. And well, the day after that, uh, they came to my house to execute a search warrant. And one of the officers came and told me, okay, if you don't confess that you send the email, we will go to your mother's house. We will destroy everything like we are doing here. We will go, we will stay, uh, go and arrest her and interrogate her. We will do the same with your girlfriend. So you decide. And well, I didn't know my rights. I didn't know whether I could have a lawyer or not. And I didn't know the implications of, of saying, yes, I did send the email. But I decided to say, yes, I did send the email, okay, to protect my beloved ones. And that was it. The thing is that when they came to my house, they were surprised by all the elements that I had, all, all the gadgets, all the equipment. And they were convinced that they, all those things were used, as, were used as tools to commit crimes. Uh, they are just tools that any information security professional has. It was just the house of somebody with my profile. I think that they have no clue of what open source intelligence means because they didn't even bother to enter into my LinkedIn account to see who I was. Uh, so they could try to see things from a different angle and try to understand why I had all those devices in my house. I had a lot of, for example, credit cards, blank credit cards, a reader and writer of magnetic cards, which has an explanation why I had that. Uh, but they were convinced that I was carding. Uh, later, in the, in the most important newspaper of the country appeared that, okay, the hacker was also uh, cloning credit cards as an affirmation without having done any research or review of the, of the material. 
they just said I was turning credit cards. That was not very professional, I think. Uh, and well, I was sent to prison. I didn't have time. I didn't understood anything. Everything was very, very fast. And I was sent to prison. I spent eight months in prison. I was denied the being released three times by the judge because she considered that my possibility of escaping the country was high and that I could alter the process because of my high uh, knowledge of computers. Basically, she was saying that with my mind, I could alter evidence that was stored and locked in a police facility, which is ridiculous. Okay, uh, my lawyer appeared, appealed uh, the, the, what the, the judge said, and after eight months, the, the appeal was in my favor. I was released with a bail. I am actually on a bail right now. Uh, and that's when I, I could get home. When I get home and I return to my house, I couldn't believe what I found. I found 30, yes, 30 hard disk drives on the floor of my apartment. 30. That was ridiculous. I mean, how could they leave 30 hard disk drives? That's impossible to understand. Uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. After a year of being released, I could finally access to the file of the case that is a 1,000 pages file that I have a copy with me, and I couldn't believe all I read. The director of security of the CERT, uh, the person which I reported the problems with the medical provider, was interviewed by the judge, and the judge asked him, Okay, did Alberto Hill report any problem in the medical provider? And his answer was, I do not recall that I checked some files and I didn't find anything. That's not an answer for that question in that scenario. You are in the middle of a criminal case and the males have a tracking number, an ID number, and all you had to do is to get into the system and answer yes or no. I do not recall, it's not an answer for that. I do not recall, it's for the judge. Okay, the director doesn't remember, so this guy didn't send anything. He's lying, and as he's lying in this, he's lying in everything. Let's put him behind cells because all he, he's saying is a lie. He's not trustable. He's lying us in everything. Why did he do that? Why? You don't forget those reports of incidents. You might forget about a virus uh, problem or I don't know. But when somebody reports that you can access to a system of a medical provider with the credentials admin, admin you, don't, you don't forget that. And the second report, also, you don't forget that. And you have to work with the medical provider in order to, to solve the problem. So I don't understand why his, his answer was that. And well, it was all very frustrating uh for me and well there were some problems such as the search warrant didn't have did my name was wrong the date was wrong and the scope of the search warrant was not respected the register of seized items was a paper saying we seized many pen drives Many hard disk drives, no chain of custody, all the evidence was contaminated, 
could never have used for anything and they chase all that from my house but then i ask for a third party independent uh, review of the investigation and that was denied it's a right that we all have in in any process of this kind uh, requesting another op opinion from somebody independent who can review all the things how they were done no that was denied and they didn't preserve the evidence which is the servers of the medical provider that they were not preserved they were not cloned they were not they didn't make any images of the servers of the information for the records uh, the only copy of the extorsive email is a printed paper uh, that's not serious at all and that is surprising that they don't follow the uh, the standards uh, regarding computer forensics in a case that is in basically is very serious they didn't do anything of the things they should have done in order to preserve the evidence. I offered them to give them all my credentials, all my username, passwords, pins, uh, anything to access to all the sensitive equipment. So they to to make them. Uh, for, to make them easy to, to review what I have because I had nothing to hide. Also, I offered them to give them my credentials to access to all my, my services uh, online, on the web. Uh, I mean, I, I offered them, I will give you all the passwords of all my computers, of all the systems that I access, of all the encrypted uh, devices that I have, and the prosecutor didn't accept. I don't understand that. I mean, everything they could do wrong, they did wrong and makes no sense. So many things that I cannot explain. And the last thing is just one tiny detail. The medical provider, uh, Here's a, a copy of, of the report to the police about the, the attack and the, well, the, the security problem. And it was made a report before they received the email. If you check the dates, uh, you see that they made a report to the police before getting the email. And the email did not have a Bitcoin address to pay for the Bitcoins that were requested. And I had to wait a year and it had to be me, the one who found, found out all that. Nobody ever pay attention to that. No one ever cared. While I was interrogated in court, the prosecutor asked me about pen drives and viruses and a USB killer and a mask of Anonymous, but they didn't ask me why this email does, doesn't have a Bitcoin address to deposit the payment. No, nobody, I mean, it was me, myself and I who had to wait one year and eight months to access to all that and find out all that. And I'm still in the process. The process is still going. And the incompetence that I am, I have to cope with is such that I feel so powerless that the only thing I can do is share the story with the world and try to, to force change in the system. Thank you. Germany, I hope to be there one day in person, really. I love your country and I love your conference. 
Thank you. What I have lived is something that uh, I couldn't imagine that could have happened to anyone. And uh, I was sent to prison in like so fast. Uh, I should have had time with my lawyer to analyze the documents that were supporting supporting the hold on a second that I think uh, supporting uh, the, the accusation. But no, I was sent to prison eight months. Nobody reviewed the documentation. Nobody found out those things that were not consistent. Those things that I have no answers, and there are no answers in the in the file. Uh, if that that happened, happened to, to anyone, anyone. And, and that's, that's scary. scary. That's, that's really scary, scary because it happened to me. Could happen to anyone, and something must be done. And here in Uruguay, I am like face, like fighting with a wall. Imagine, I offer uh, to, to provide all the passwords to so they can review my equipment without any problem. I offer them, uh, I ask for a review of a third party. They denied everything without a justification. They didn't justify the, the things that they denied. So it's basically, I am powerless against a system that is powerful. And here, there's not much more than I can do than just go on with the system where the judge has no knowledge about all these things related to computer-related crimes. She doesn't have to know, but she has to have competent people that uh, give support to the judge in order to understand the problem. But those people are incompetent and she has to trust them. So I'm in a situation that is, is, is really, really sad. And I don't find uh, a solution for this because all I, have, I did all I could to have a fast process to clear things fast. But no, the system has its time. Uh, it's taking ages. And all the answers that I get are not reasonable, and I don't know what's going to, what's going to be the, the end of all this, but it's obviously not fair uh, for me, and it, it shouldn't be like this. There should be a change. It's, it's obvious. Well, personally, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so we have the first question coming in from the audience who I think is still digesting what you just said. And um, I remember during, during the video, uh, you, re you mentioned like when you came back to your apartment that there were like 30 hard disk uh, drives uh, kind of spread across, across the floor. And um, the question is uh, that obviously, can you add some, some more context? It wasn't 100% clear. What was the purpose of those 30 hard drives? What's the content? Uh, were these your own, oh. or did somebody throw them onto your the, onto your floor? Can you just add a few, a, a bit more background yeah. information and 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 add context, please? Yes, sure. That's a good question. Uh, basically, uh, I was doing a research. I was going. Uh, I was going. I was buying used hard disk drive for computers that were being uh, sent to trash. And I got them for for almost nothing, for a very low prices. I got hard disk drives, and I was doing a, a research about what the information those hard disk drives had. Uh, for example, there were hard disk drives for companies, and I could see that they didn't have any uh, kind of uh, measure to wipe the information, to delete the information before uh, sending the computers to trash. Uh, so I, I bought that for, for that purpose, they were mine, and I'm actually lucky that, uh, in part, that they left them, because the contents were not mine, actually, I, 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 it's a Pandora box, I, I, I didn't know what they could have found, and probably it would meant more problems to me, but, uh, yeah, they were mine, and I have to add, not only that, I said 30 hard disk drive, but they also left three computers, three cell phones, uh, among other things that they didn't say. Is. 
unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Um, so on one hand, with, uh, w with what you did, it wasn't only environmentally friendly, like recycling um, the stuff, but also obviously um, checking how companies or owners of computers um, deal with the data stored on those HDDs. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's lack of awareness. I mean, here in Uruguay, uh, we need a lot of awareness about information security. We are, well, compare, I think it's all the same. The justice, the police, the companies are all in the same level of maturity in terms of information security. We are like 10 hundred years be, uh, behind the rest of the world. Wow. Um, so at the moment, we didn't get any additional questions. And this is not because people aren't interesting. I think, um, again, it is, it is, um, it is absolutely un unbelievable. And I think hard for the people to believe that this is actually in a reality in, you know, the year 2019 slash uh, the year 2020. Um, Give me one second, because now my pad also just um, crashed. Um, feedback I'm 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 getting is um, thanks for the talk. What a horrifying story! Um, and then, of course, um, a question that is also um, you know coming to my mind. You're saying that the case still isn't over yet for for you so question from from the audience now is um are you still facing the fallout of all this and how are you doing today yeah yeah i mean it's been very complicated for me uh it's not easy and spending time in prison uh, it's something that uh leave scars in you uh, it, it changes you. I mean, somebody with my profile that is not violent, it uh, has never committed a crime, is from one day to another uh, introduced into an environment full of violence, full of drugs, full of things that you are not used to, to be around. And eight months in that environment cause you health problems. It's not easy to deal with that. I mean, I never thought I would have to go to, sh to prison. And well, after I was released, incredible, uh, the director of a security company uh, in South America contacted me and he offered me a pen testing position. Uh, so I was like, in society here and anywhere in the world, they don't see me as a criminal. They don't consider me as a criminal. And actually, in the market, they they actually see it as as a as a plus, as a bonus. If I, if you spend time in prison, it's like your market value goes up. Like I don't know, Kevin Mitnick, uh, all the the most famous hackers spend time in prison, so it's like your status goes up. But okay, uh, I wish I wouldn't have to 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 leave that, and I didn't accept the the, the position because. Uh, I was coping with uh, some post-traumatic stress disorder and other conditions uh, that were direct caused by the prison time, uh, and I had a lot, a lot of uh, offers to, to work from many companies in Uruguay and other countries that I had to reject because my my doctor that is treating me. He doesn't recommend me to, to enter into any uh, position that requires uh, a lot of uh, responsibility. So that's the pay. That, that's the price that I am paying right now for for all that. Uh, so it, it's not nice. Uh, but uh, uh, I am living, and I can't change the past. I hope to change the future. I hope to 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 be the the last person that lived something like this in Uruguay, 
uh, well, and with all the elements that I have, I think eventually the case will close in my favor. I mean, if it's not, I could eventually go to an international tribunal in The Hague or uh, I don't know. And in, in that scenario, I, I, there's no chance I can lose. But that involves a lot of energies, time, money, that after three years, I am very, I have lost a lot of energies and my health, uh, I, I need to take care of my health. So I have to put everything in, in a balance and decide what to do. Do I, do I go with this till the end? I would like to, because if I do, I know I will win and that will, yes or yes, make things change in Uruguay if I do that. But on the other hand, I have to think of my health uh, and my, my family. Uh, and this hasn't been easy for, for any of us. Yeah, I understand. And um, on a, so, so what do you think if you, at, if you have the, the, the energy at all to, to, to think about it? Um, not sure if I would have it, to be perfectly honest with you. What do you think would need to happen in your country in order for the system to change? Is it a lack of um, education related to cybersecurity topics um, in general? Is it a problem that lies within the, um, the, the legal system in, in, in total? But I mean, you mentioned that Inter even Interpol got involved and they didn't behave any better. So um, any, any thoughts um, on that? So how, how do you think or what, what would need to be done um, that well, it won't happen again yeah. and that your case will be closed pretty quickly um, and, of course, yeah. to your yeah. favor? Uh, yes, good question. There are many elements that are involved uh, in, in the whole problem that I could visualize. I mean, I, I, have the, I, I was lucky that I had the experience of having worked in computer forensics I have experience in that, so I could clearly visualize the problems that maybe another person uh, without uh, my profile or my experience would never be able to, to defend themselves and they wouldn't uh, notice, for example, the problems that for me were obvious. The thing is that for the first thing is the legal, from the legal aspect, the laws in Uruguay are from the last century and there are no legislation or laws against computer crimes. Uh, if you hack a computer system, it's not a crime in Uruguay. All the crimes related to computers are uh, prosecuted by analogy. For example, if you are a victim of a ransomware attack, uh, they used the, the case of the old of the old legislation that is uh extortion but there's no such thing as computer related crimes uh if you re re if you release confidential information well there's a law from a hundred years ago where you, if you release uh, confidential information and you work for the government then that's a crime so it's all with analogies there are no laws related to computer crimes that's the first thing there should be a new legislation and we should uh, update and be, be aware that we are in the 21st century, it's 2020, and we, have, we, we cannot keep using uh, laws that were created 100 years ago. That's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, when you mentioned about the, when you asked me about the, the interpolations and uh, the competence, well, they do here in Uruguay, they do not require any certification, any certain uh, experience or anything in order to work for in computer forensics. For example, you can be a person who started in the police and then was uh, ch being changed in positions, and you end up because you know about computers in the in in the part of computer forensics, which, but you have no qualifications, no, no formation about that. And in, even in South America, in the region in Argentina, 
if you are going to work as a computer uh, in computer forensics for the government, you re they are required to have certain uh, certifications from SANS, I think, I'm not sure, but you, you need to prove that you are competent for that. It doesn't happen that here in Uruguay. So those are two things that need to be improved, the legal system and also uh, the people, uh, the, the processes and the police has to also be uh, need a change to, to address all these, these problems. Yeah, and it sounds like um, your country isn't the only one that still has a long way to go, unfortunately. Yes, I am. I was after my story was made public, and well, uh, it was part of a podcast called Darknet Diaries, and it was heard by um, 200, more than 200,000 people. I was contacted by people from all over the world and people that experience uh, also not things like mine, because my situation is an extreme case that it's for a movie, a comic movie, or, or a, I don't know, a tragic movie, I don't know what, but people from Turkey, from other countries in Central America, they also have those problems uh, with the laws and the law enforcement. Uh, yeah, it's not only Uruguay. On the other hand, in the region, as I told you, Argentina, which is our neighborhood, uh, is pretty advanced in that in that part. Brazil also, uh, but maybe the smallest countries are not. And who, how do we internationally do we force the, the countries to adopt certain? I don't know. We have to use certain. Uh, norms or you have to require this to, to do this job. I don't know. I thought, for example, Interpol should have a standard worldwide. Before what happened to me, I, I took for granted Interpol should work in the same way all over the world, should have the same requirements all over the world. But it's not like that. Uh, how, how do do the, the, the world that sees this problem force the country to, to make changes? Uh, me alone, I can I can do it. But if I share my story, maybe somebody will actually do something, or somebody will contact me, or something will happen. But the key is to talk about the problem and reach as many people as possible, because the change will happen eventually. It's a matter of time, uh, that's for sure. But it has to be immediately, from from my point of view. Yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, but anyway, good to hear. I'm, I'm just um, also checking and I see that obviously your story got, or let's say the beginning of, of your of your horrible story has already been um, picked up by uh, Linus um, two years ago at the 35th C3. Um, so anybody out there who is interested in learning more about your story, because we are now also running out of time a little bit, um, can definitely find more background information. I think also um, anybody out there who would like to give you additional personal support uh, can contact you uh, via Twitter and I'm pretty sure through many other social media channels. Um, I don't know what to say. So the, the only thing that comes to my mind still is if Hollywood would, would pick your story up, I think it will definitely have to be a thriller. That is the only category I think that is suitable. You are not the first person that, that, that had told me that. You're like, I don't know, everybody that hears my story ends up with the conclusion, this has been, they have to be a, a movie about your story or a TV series because Mr. Robot it's nothing compared to what you had to live. Uh, there must be a movie, at least a documentary about my story. And, and, and actually that would be uh, a, a nice way or a good way to, to reach uh, the, the people that I want to reach as many as possible. I mean, having a, in a documentary or a movie or whatever uh, could, could be very, very positive in my objective to 
to generate a change somehow. Yeah, indeed. Um, I would uh, definitely think so uh, too. Alberto, again, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story. Um, absolutely amazing. Um, good luck, fingers crossed. Um, I think everybody here says, ah, <laughs> you are, you're very, very welcome. Oh man, <laughs> lovely guy. Um, yeah, so we are keeping our fingers crossed that everything will turn out perfectly for you and that, um, you know, you will be a true free man and professional in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.